If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Matthew chapter 28. Verses 16 through 20. And I want to just reemphasize this text. As you know, this is the end of the line, if you will, for Jesus Christ in the sense that he is now preparing for his ascension. The resurrection has taken place. And these are the last words that he's speaking on earth. I don't know if you've ever been around someone and heard their last words spoken before they departed this earth. But those are usually, normally, some of the most important words. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has gathered around him his disciples and others, and he is speaking the very last few sentences before he ascends to sit at the right hand of God their Father, and intercede each and every day for our well-being. And that as you and I go to him in prayer, whether it is a private prayer in our home or a public prayer here in the corporate setting of the church, we enter into his presence boldly, for there Christ is seated and interceding for each and every one of us. What a blessing, isn't it, beloved, that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ who understands our every trials and tribulations, our every pains and, and our every groans. He understands them in ways that even we don't. What a blessing it is. But here, to set the context for you, Christ is speaking. Now listen again to the words that Reverend Maxevany read. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you. I am with you always to the end of the age. Beloved, let us bow for a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your presence now. And we would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our refuge, and our redeemer. And it is our prayer on this Sunday in which we focus on the importance of evangelism that your role as redeemer would manifest itself in a way that motivates our hearts and convicts our spirits to the point that we literally cannot be quiet about the things of Christ and of your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was preparing this week for this Sunday, we just completed the one another's and what we are to be doing as a church body, one for another. Now we're going to focus this morning on what we can do corporately and collectively as a body of Christ, as a church, and then as individuals within the church as members of the army of Almighty God. I was very blessed this week in my research to study a previous sermon by Dr. Kennedy in which he focused on the importance of being faithful as members of the body of Christ. He even used the Marine title, uh, the motto of the Marine, Semper Fi, or Semper Fidelis, meaning always faithful. And if you've ever met a Marine, you never ask them, were you a Marine? They have always been a Marine. And there's a sense in which you cannot ask another Christian, 
Were you a Christian? You've always been a Christian. If Christ has pierced your heart and redeemed you and called you, then you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning as you consider your own life, how are you doing in the area of being faithful? How are you doing in the area of being faithful and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to your neighbor, to those that you work with, to your family members? It's oftentimes one of the most difficult things to do, isn't it? To share that gift that you've been given. But I believe it is not only important, I believe it is critical to the life of any church. For a healthy church, Gene Get says, has three important characteristics. First of all, Get says that a healthy church, that they need sound biblical teaching. They need to be rooted each and every Sunday in the Word of God in which the authority of Holy Scripture is manifested and God's inspired and infallible and inerrant Word is proclaimed each and every Sunday in every aspect of the church life. It is to be rooted and built on the Word of Almighty God. I believe in our church we are that kind of church. We are a church that believes in the authority of Holy Scripture. It is our road map. If we are lost, we go back to that holy book. And that book shows us the way. And one of the things it shows us and teaches us is that we are called to share the love of Christ. He also says not only does the church need sound biblical teaching, but it needs deep and satisfying relationships. We just finished a seven-week series on the importance of relationships in the body, serving one another, loving one another, building one another up, confessing our sins to one another, instructing one another, edifying and encouraging one another. And he says it is so critical that we develop deep, long-lasting, satisfying relationships in Christ and with one another. In other words, your friends should be a part of the body of Christ and those that you can go to and enjoy their company. It doesn't mean that you can't have friends outside the church, but it means that you should be having deep, lasting relationship. But he also says the third critical quality of any healthy church is one that is oftentimes left out, and that is they need to experience seeing People come to Jesus Christ as a result of the corporate and individual witness that they are to bear witness for the things of Christ. They need to see another person's heart transformed by the blood of Christ. They need to see another person's heart melted from st turned from stone and melted by the grace of Almighty, Rock, Almighty Christ through grace and through mercy. They need to understand that salvation is a gift and is grace. And I ask you this morning, have you seen that happen? Many of you have because of your work and your diligence and your dedication with evangelism. Many of you, over half of you, are probably here as a result of evangelism explosion or someone coming to your house and knocking on your door or meeting with you and leading you to Christ through this simple but profound plan. But I ask you, brother, beloved, are you resting on your laurels? Have you, in the last three months, been involved in sharing your faith or leading another person to Christ? Oftentimes we hear excuses. I know I have, and I've been guilty of giving them in the past. You know, I'm not very gifted at that. That is not my gift, or that's not my talent. Well, hopefully you'll see in just a little while that that is an excuse. But we must remember that the church does not exist, beloved, for its members, for its own members' self-interest. We are not in a world to bear witness just to ourselves, but we are to bear witness of the grace of God and Jesus Christ to those around us. We are not saved simply for our own well-being, but we're saved to serve and to bear witness the love of Christ. It is not for self-centered interests that we have been saved. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. You have been saved to declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into light. The last words of Jesus were simple. To go forth and to make disciples. To baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to teach them the things of Christ. They were commanded. It is the Great Commission. It is found five times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 8. We see it five times. The Great Commission. And this Great Commission is really a command. Jesus has given us here the mission of the church. It's set in a context, and the context is worship, because as Jesus gathered the, the disciples around and others, they came, and as Scripture said, the first thing they did was worship our Savior. And what's so beautiful about evangelism is that it flows naturally out of worship. John Piper says this, he says, that the fuel for evangelism is worship. And that's why worship is one of our four pillars. As you come together on Sunday, as you gather in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and as you worship the King of Kings, it is our prayer and our desire that through the preaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, the singing of the Word, the expression of the Word through the Apostles' Creed and other ways that your heart is stimulated and motivated and moved that as you leave, you will go forth to evangelize, to share the love of Christ. That is why we have things like messages to go now that you can pick up a tape. If you're the ultimate introvert and you're scared to death of saying, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ, then you can just give them the tape. But beloved, I pray that you will overcome your fear because Christ did not give you a spirit of timidity. He did not give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a, a spirit of faith in which you were called to share the love of Christ. Yes, many, many are afraid. But we have programs, even one now starting in our church as we formed our EE committee and we've had two meetings. And we're re-energizing that program and that ministry. And on October the 1st, you'll have an opportunity to come to the Share Your Faith workshop. If you're afraid, beloved, I pray that you will be in deep prayer, asking Almighty God to give you the power to overcome your fear, that you will move forth and learn how to express and share your faith. As we move deeper into the sermon, I want you to understand why we should be doing this. It's not enough for me to stand up here and to try to get you energized to do it. I want you to understand why you should do it. I want you to understand why Christ has called us to do it. And I want us to see what motivates others to share their love of Christ. First of all, if you look at your scripture in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, the first thing you'll see is, why should I evangelize? First is because God commands it. He commands it of us. Verse 19, go and make disciples. He's not asking you to go and make disciples. He's not suggesting that you go and make disciples. It's like my mom used to say about the Ten Commandments. Jim, it's not the Ten Suggestions. You know, I'm not suggesting that you not lie, cheat, or steal. We are commanding it in this house. And if you do, there will be consequences to pay. It's not the ten suggestions. God, through Jesus Christ there, does not have the, the disciples gathered around him, and, and he's not saying in his last words, hey, I, if you have time, I hope you can. No, he's saying go and make disciples. His last words are really our first word. It's critical to the life of the church because he commands it. Go and make disciples. 
He commands us to evangelize, to make disciples, verse 19, to be baptized, to teach others, to be baptized, meaning to publicly profess our faith in Jesus Christ. It is a command. This week as I was reading some of Dr. Boyce's work and Dr. Sproul's work as well in preparation for this, I came across a hilarious story about Dr. Sproul. I once remember vaguely him talking in class about this many years ago, but I would like to share it with you because it sums up how funny oftentimes it is when we want to neglect this command. Dr. Sproul was sitting in class at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary as a young seminarian around the age of 22 or 23, and Dr. John Gerstner was his professor. Dr. Gerstner was teaching a class on predestination and evangelism. I'm sure very similar to Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, which I do ask you to please read. A tremendous book. But back to Dr. Sproul's class. He's sitting there in a semicircle, kind of half circle there. And Dr. Gerstner asked the question. He said, if predestination is true, and we all believe it in the Reformed faith, why should we be involved in evangelism? And so he looked to his left, to the first seminarian, and the young student said, Dr. Gerstner, I have no clue. And so he looked to the second seminarian, and the second seminarian said, you know, I've really never thought about that. <laughs> you got to really realize these seminarians are deep guys, you know. And so... So he goes to the third seminary and he says, well, Dr. Gerstner, I'm glad you asked that question. I've often wondered it myself. And so Dr. Gerstner realized he was not getting anywhere very fast and so he continued to make his way around the circle and they couldn't answer the question. And finally they came to, I'm sure the star pupil, Dr. Sproul, and they asked Dr. Sproul, and he said, well, uh, Mr. Sproul, why does God Command us. I mean, why does God give us both predestination and evangelism? If predestination is true, why, Mr. Sproul, should you be involved in evangelism? And Dr. Sproul said this. He said, well, Dr. Gerstner, I, I'm not sure if this is really what you're looking for, and I don't really have a, a real profound answer to give you. Um, and he was sinking in his chair, he writes. And finally he looked up and he said, well, I guess maybe because God commands it. And here's exactly what Dr. Gerstner said. He laughed and he grinned and he said, yes, Mr. Sproul, God does command us to be involved in evangelism. And of course, what could be more insignificant than the fact that the Lord of glory the Savior of our soul, the Lord God omnipotent, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, has commanded you, Mr. Sproul, to be involved in evangelism. What could be more insignificant? And Dr. Sproul said he just completely collapsed because it drove home the point. We have been commanded, beloved by Almighty God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, in a commissioning ceremony to go forth and to share the love of Christ. It's not a suggestion. And beloved, I pray that when your commander in chief speaks, that you will listen, for he does have your best interests at heart. One of the beautiful things in the military culture that I came from was to attend a commissioning ceremony in which a young lieutenant is receiving his commission. It's a fairly sacred and meaningful time in which he raises his right hand. And he says, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it continues. And then at the very end, praise God, this has not been stripped. It, he says, so help me God. Beloved, you have been commissioned by Almighty God to be brought into his family and into his army. And that commissioning ceremony took place as the angels praised Almighty God the day that your heart was redeemed by the blood of Christ. 
and angels praised him. And there was singing in heaven, but it was not just singing in heaven for you only. It was singing in heaven because God knew the capability and the possibility that he had in you to go forth and to share the love of Christ. It is the laity's responsibility. As the minister of the gospel, our call is to equip you and to train you. It is not my responsibility. It is my responsibility to lead and to shepherd and to be first at the EE meeting. But it is not my full responsibility or any of our ministers. God has called you, and you see this in Acts chapter 8, as the people of God in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation, they scattered throughout the area. But what does the scripture say in Acts 8? And the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And they sent the people out to share the love of Christ. Beloved, the New Testament church spread not because of the Apostle Paul or Barnabas or Silas or Timothy. They equipped. The New Testament church spread because of the people of Almighty God. Because at work and at play and in the community, they were willing to take their stand and share the love of Almighty Christ because they realized that they had been commanded to do this. And this is hard for us because we don't like to be told what to do. But your commander and king has ordered it of you, his church. Secondly, why should we evangelize? Simply put, because of God's wrath that will come on those who do not know him. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great minister, was once asked, don't you fear the nuclear holocaust? Don't you fear the power of nuclear weapons? And Lloyd-Jones said, well, certainly, I have some anxiety about that and some concern. But then he said, I don't fear it near like I fear the wrath of Almighty God. Beloved, people are lost. You see it every day. People are lost without Christ, and Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of that lost, lostness in Luke 15. If you go to Luke 15, you see three powerful parables. The parable of the lost sheep in which Christ, the great shepherd, is teaching a point here. There are 99 sheep in the pen, but Christ goes after that one lost sheep because he has a heart of compassion. He has a passion for the word of God, but he has a passion for the world. And he goes and he gathers that sheep and he brings him back. I'm sure that many of you seated here this morning have been that lost sheep. I'm sure many of you seated here this morning have been that prodigal son in which as you came back, the father's arms were open and he received you with mercy and grace. Then there's a parable, not only about the lost sheep, but God through Christ kind of ups the ante and it's the parable of the lost coin. A coin was worth more than a sheep in which the virgin had lost her coin and they go to find it. And then ultimately it concludes with the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. There is a lostness there in the world and God's wrath is real. The lost will face the judgment of Almighty God and God is storing up his wrath. I don't like to think about that very often because it's unpleasant, isn't it? To think that he is storing up his wrath. Jonathan Edwards preached a powerful sermon, Sinners in the Hand of, the, of an Angry God, and I invite you to encourage you to read that sometime. But every time I read it, I just kind of have to go away for a while because it's so moving. 
Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And in Revelation 20 says, If anyone, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. Beloved, I guess what I'm saying here in conclusion of the second point is that hell is real. There is a lake of fire. There are consequences to our actions. We go out into the community and the person that does not know Christ will one day face Christ on judgment day and he will not be asked into heaven. He will, his name will not be recorded in that book of life. How painful that'll be. But you know, oftentimes, we are more concerned about other things, aren't we? We are more concerned about our financial portfolio or the decorations of our home than the loss. But beloved, I pray that you will remember, and this is simply not fire and hellstone preaching, this is the word of God preaching that there will be a consequence for those, a judgment for those. So I pray your heart is motivated out of the command of Almighty God. I pray it's motivated out of compassion for the lost, knowing that they will receive the wrath of Almighty God and that that will cause you to overcome your own fear, your own anxiety, to step out and to share, that you will not be afraid or insecure or worried about what other people think are being ostracized. Remember the Apostle Paul said, it is a privilege to suffer. And beloved, this is a war, and this war is raging, and it is getting worse. Whether it's the state of California this week telling people in their own neighborhood, you cannot hold a Bible study in your home, own home. Whether it's that, or whether it's someone in a school sitting there opening their Bible, just opening their Bible. A junior high student opening their Bible at recess reading quietly in the corner and being asked to leave school and take it and have their Bible taken away. Amazing! That in our country, this is going on. Wickedness and evilness is present. We are in a battle. We are at the church triumphant but we are also the church militant. The view of the church should be one of a hospital for sinners as well as an army for God. Both images are found in Holy Scripture. And God has called us to march out and to be drafted and to he has enlisted us to go forth. Finally, beloved, and I appreciate your patience, we are called and commanded to go forth and to share and to evangelize because of God's love. Because of God's love, out of appreciation for what he's done for you and for me. How he has redeemed our own heart, a thankful spirit, out of a love for the lost and out of a compassion for others. There are many people that will spend days trying to track down their lost pet. Not that I'm against dogs, I like dogs, I have one. Pets are great, they become part of the family, but sometimes we're more concerned about them and finding them than that we are in finding the lost. Or we're more concerned about church buildings, not that I wouldn't like to have one, amen? I mean, it would be great, instead of coming from the coach's office, it'd be nice to come from my own study here. I got it. You know, we're concerned about that, and it is important. But church buildings often can appear as doctor's offices. We sit and wait for people to come in. And that's what many churches do today. They sit and wait for people to come in and fill the pew. That is not the image and the picture of the New Testament church. It is people moving out, marshalling together, rallying together, and literally going out to save the lost for the love of Christ. The task of seeking belongs to the church. It is our responsibility, the Christian community. We are called to equip the saints, to mobilize the laity, and the gospel spread as a result of the people of God being equipped. One of the 
funny illustrations that came to my mind this week is I had the opportunity to go with Bill Lampkin by the Dolphins training facility down in Dayton. Being a sports freak, I enjoyed that and uh, probably could have stayed there all day just kind of looking around, but it was nighttime and we just kind of did a windshield drive-by. And I thought, I thought about this in connection with this sermon. What if you said, let's take Reggie Bush. He's a new addition to the Dolphins. I, I hope eventually a positive addition. I don't know, but we'll see. They haven't started out that well. But let's say you take a pro football player like Reggie Bush, who's a new addition to the Dolphins team. He's on the team, and one day uh, you go down to the training, uh, to the practice field there, and he's not out on the field. He's kind of in the little uh, uh, store there buying a few things, a few pom-poms and a few Go Dolphins things. And then you go Sunday to the game, and you sit down in the stand, and you look over, and there he is waving, going, Go Dolphins. And you naturally would say, Reggie, what are you doing? Aren't you supposed to be out on the field playing? Didn't we draft you and sign you to play? Didn't we pay you to play? Isn't that what you're called to do? In some ways, beloved, that is kind of what has happened to the Christian church. We have become fans, great fans, of many activities, but that is not what God has called us to do. He's not called us to be fans. Our cheerleaders, in a sense, he's called us to be players on the field, not, sp not a spectator up in the stands as a spectator sport, but literally on the field as a member of the team, using your gift, using your talent, using your ability to move forward the cause of Christ, which is to evangelize a lost world and to share the love of Christ. Naturally, we need to be encouraging, and there is an element of, of cheering for one another. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is putting on the uniform of Christ that has been clothed in the righteousness and the blood of Christ and looking to the Heavenly Father and saying, Lord, teach me how to play in an honorable way for your glory. And one of those ways, beloved, one of those words is to learn how to share your faith. And that's why in just a few moments, after we close, there's some blue cards here. I ask you to take them out. And this blue card says, New Presbyterian Church, Share Your Faith Workshop, October the 1st. If you want to learn how to share the love of Jesus Christ to the lost, I invite you to come to this. This is your opportunity. And if you can't come to this, I invite you to encourage someone else to. And it gives you an opportunity to check one of the marks there. And I, I pray that if you can't come, you would still fill this card out if you're interested in learning how to tell others about the love of Christ. Because, beloved, I dare say that probably 90% of you seated here today would not be here with a peace that passes all understanding if it were not for someone sharing the love of Christ to you. So I encourage you to fill this card out. I encourage you to come on October the 1st. I don't care if you've been there before. I don't care if somebody said, well, what if I've been a, 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 a trainer at the third level? I said, I don't care if you're a Jedi Knight. I, I, you know, I, I could care less. I just want you there if you can come to begin to begin again, to learn from your wisdom, to share, to teach us, to train us. How to do this, that we might mobilize. Just as the apostles stated in Jerusalem, they sent out the laity. Beloved, we have been all called for this. This is not an option. This is not an option. So I pray that as you fill this out, in a minute we're going to have another offering. And this offering is not a financial offering. This offering is an offering of your time, an offering of your effort, an offering of your resources. And so after the final hymn is, is taken place, we're going to have the ushers come and they're going to pass the offering plate. And I'm going to ask you if you would fill this out and make a commitment. One of the elders said, you should have them stand up. I said, well, that might embarrass them. He goes, that might be good for them. I don't want to embarrass you, beloved. <laughs> 
I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. And he wants to encourage you as well. That you would feel and make a commitment. It's time now. It's time that we commit to this one pillar of four. And that is evangelism. There will be other opportunities to commit to the cultural mandate pillar. To the reform theology education pillar. And of course to the worship pillar. But this Sunday, I'm asking you to commit to this. And it is my prayer that just as Dolby came up and shared that took place in India, it might take place here. Let us stand now as we close our worship with the singing of our hymn.